It's been a dramatic day at the U.S. Capitol. In the second public hearing in the impeachment inquiry into President Trump, the witness was Marie Yovanovitch, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Mr. Trump derided her in his July phone call with Ukraine's president. That is now at the center of this investigation. Many of today's questions focused on how and why he fired her. In a first, Mr. Trump resorted to Twitter to attack her while she was testifying. There's a lot to unpack from this day, and here to look at it all, Yamish Alcindor is at the White House. Our Lisa Desjardins was in the committee room. She joins us now at the in our studio, along with Nick Schifrin, who's also at the table. Hello to all of you. There is a lot to unpack. Lisa, I'm going to start with you. The day pretty much started. Here we have a career diplomat, and they went right to the firing, mm -hmm. what, how it happened, what happened, how she felt about it when it mm -hmm. happened, and she talked about feeling threatened. I think the Democrats here were trying to show real damage. And Ambassador Yovanovitch, for who watched this hearing, she was very consistent in her testimony. She was trying to provide direct answers. She did not get very emotional, except occasionally. But the words she said described emotion that she went through as first she was ousted and as the president attacked her on Twitter. Let's listen to some of what she said. I was shocked and devastated that um, I would feature in a phone call between two heads of state uh, in such a manner uh, where um, President Trump said that I was bad news to another world leader uh, and that I would be going through some things. Um, so I was, it, it was, it was a terrible moment. Uh, a person who saw me actually reading the transcript said that the color drained from my face. I think I even had a physical reaction. Um, I, I think... You know, even now, words kind of fail me. That, of course, is the call between President Trump, the man she was, she had been serving, and President Zelensky, the man she was trying to sort of help his country with. And she never said she expected to be in that call. Also, Judy, she was asked how her family is coping with this. And that was sort of a very heavy moment where you could almost feel her bracing herself. And she said quietly, she doesn't want to talk about that. Yeah, that was, that was something that came through on the, on the television screen as we were watching. So, Yamish, meantime, at the White House, the president was paying attention. Tell us about that. The president was ready to defend himself in real time, but defending himself meant, in this case, attacking Ambassador Yovanovitch as she was testifying publicly in this impeachment inquiry. I want to read to you some of the tweets that the president sent out because they are, in, in some ways, quite remarkable. Here's the, here are two tweets that he sent out. Everywhere Marie Yovanovitch went turned bad. She started off in Somalia. How did that go? Then fast forward to Ukraine, where the new Ukrainian president spoke unfavorably about her in my second phone call with him. It is a U.S. president's absolute right to appoint ambassadors. He went on to say, with all of that, however, I have done far more for Ukraine than, oh, referring to President Obama. Now, I have to fact check here. The president is saying that it was the president of Ukraine who actually had an issue with Marie Yovanovitch, when, in fact, on that July 25th phone call, the president of Ukraine says very clearly, thank you, Mr. President, thank you, President Trump, for being the first person to bring up that Marie Yovanovitch was a bad ambassador. So it was President Trump who initially said that Marie Yovanovitch had a problem and that he did not like the work that she was doing. And then, and then the president of Ukraine essentially says, I agree with you. So while the president was lashing out at the ambassador, he was also misleading the American public in these tweets. And uh, Yamish, we know that not long after the president did uh, tweet those criticisms of her, uh, the ambassador was asked about it by Chairman Adam Schiff. Let's watch that. Would you like to respond to the president's attack that everywhere you went turned bad? Well, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think I have such powers, uh, not in Mogadishu, Somalia, Somalia, not in other places. I actually think that um, where I've served over the years, um, I and others have demonstrably um, made things better, you know, for the U.S. as well as for the countries uh, that I've served in. Notwithstanding the fact that, as you testified earlier, the president implicitly threatened you in that call record. And now the president in real time is attacking you. What effect do you think that has on other witnesses' willingness to come forward and expose wrongdoing? Well, uh, it's very intimidating. It's designed to intimidate, is it not? 
I mean, I can't speak to what the president is trying to do, but I think the effect is to be intimidating. And Yamish, that brought a round of reaction uh, and conversation about whether the president was trying to intimidate a witness. Democrats said that the president was essentially trying to witness tamper here and that he was trying to intimidate Ambassador Yovanovitch with his, with his tweets. At the White House, the president was specifically questioned about that. Here's what he said. And I'll tell you about what tampering is. Tampering is when a guy like Shifty Shift doesn't let us have lawyers. Tampering is when Shift doesn't let us have witnesses, doesn't let us speak. I've been watching today. The president is saying that Republicans didn't have a chance to have lawyers speak within that public hearing. But in fact, a Republican lawyer was questioning Ambassador Yovanovitch throughout the day, as was a Democratic lawyer, along with lawmakers. So the president there was lashing out and unloading at Ambassador Yovanovitch. He also made the point that he essentially has free speech, that he as an American can say whatever he wants to say. But there are a lot of people who are looking at the president and saying his words have more weight than the average American. His Twitter account has some 50 to 60 million people who are following him. So when he attacks Ambassador Yovanovitch, there are people who are worried that she will possibly be attacked or possibly be criticized by even more people. And of course, Ambassador Yovanovitch says that this is very, very painful for her. But the president is essentially saying, I can say whatever I want to say. So, Nick, uh, let's go back into the hearing room because there were a number of things that were brought up today. But one of them uh, related to all this was what Ambassador Yovanovitch had to say about the effect of all this on people who work at the State Department. Yeah, what she called a smear campaign against her, the effect of the campaign that started really last year but really took place uh, or accelerated earlier this year, Ukrainian officials inventing facts because they wanted her gone, facts then repeated on Fox News in the Hill newspaper paper by Rudy Giuliani, by Donald Trump Jr. leading the president to lose confidence in her, and then the State Department bringing her home early. And she said, I'm not the only one who's going through this. She called it a part of a campaign against foreign service professionals. And they said, she said that those for foreign service professionals were being denigrated, being undermined. And it's not only the people in the State Department. She said the State Department itself was visibly unraveling. The crisis has moved from the impact on individuals to an impact on the institution itself. The State Department is being hollowed out from within at a competitive and complex time on the world stage. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. What I'd like to say is while I, I um, obviously don't dispute that the President has the right to, um, to withdraw an ambassador at, at, at any time for any reason, um, but what I do wonder is why it was necessary to smear my reputation. And Ambassador Yovanovitch blamed Secretary of State Pompeo, senior officials, for not defending her mm -hmm. from that smear campaign. And she said the impact was U.S. ambassadors no longer having the faith that the U.S. government would defend them for doing their jobs. Extraordinarily serious charges against the man who still is her boss, Secretary of State Pompeo. There's no on-the-record response from the State Department to what she said, but political appointees in the State Department say they are continuing their job, they're not feeling this, but Foreign Service officers I talked to say they're definitely feeling that this is not a good moment for them inside the State Department. So meantime, Lisa, Republicans on the Intelligence yeah. Committee not happy at all about these impeachment proceedings. Uh, what, step back for us. What are they trying to accomplish uh, from their point of view, and do they think they're doing it? They went into this week saying they wanted to do a few specific things. One of them, they wanted to show that Ukraine is generally a corrupt country and that President Trump has long been concerned about that corruption. That came up a few times today. But I don't think that really was an overall message that they hit home so much. It's, an, it's something that they will come back to. Uh, they also have wanted to make the point that, uh, that there really was Ukrainian interference in the president's campaign, something Nick's talked about a lot as well. Again, that's something that I think they mentioned. But to me, Judy, their most more successful moments were in pointing out what uh, Ambassador Yovanovitch could not say that she could not directly connect the president to some of these things that the Democrats are saying were the problems. Here's an exchange from Representative Chris Stewart of Utah in which he really gets to this idea of what do you know about possible impeachable offenses? Let's listen. Do you have any information regarding the president of the United States accepting any bribes? No. Do you have any information regarding any criminal activity that the President of the United States has been involved with at all? No. Thank you. Thank you for answering that directly. The American people know this is nonsense. The American people know this is unfair. 
And I have a prediction regarding this. I think that public support for impeachment is actually going to be less when these hearings are over than it is when the hearings began. Because finally, the American people are going to be able to see the evidence. And they're going to be able to make their own determination regarding that. And of course, when he talks about the American people, for Republicans, they're thinking a lot about the Republican base and Trump voters. Those are the folks who think this is unfair. And of course, another part of the Republican strategy here, Nick, is bringing up the connection to Joe Biden, his son Hunter Biden, who served on the board of this Ukrainian energy company. Uh, fill us in on how that went. Right. The two lines of attack that Lisa just mentioned are Ukraine criticized candidate Trump in 2016 and Ukraine's corrupt. And those two things are the reason that President Trump should be skeptical of the new Ukrainian government. That's the logic there. So first criticism in 2016, we heard uh, Representative Jim Jordan go through quite a few Ukrainian officials who criticized candidate Trump. Ambassador Ivanovich said, that doesn't mean the Ukrainian government undermine U.S. elections, and she reminded the committee that it was Russia that attacked in 2016. And then corruption. And, and, and the focus, of course, was Burisma, the largest energy company in Ukraine, so corrupt. After 2014, it was the first company that the British investigated for corruption. Uh, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, was on the board of that company while Vice President Biden was dealing with Ukrainian officials. And earlier this week, we heard from another State Department official, George Kent, said he approached Biden's office saying, hey, I'm concerned about this. And we heard Representative John Ratcliffe, Republican of Texas, ask about that again today. Did you ever, do you agree with that? Yeah. That it was a legitimate concern to raise? I, I think that it could raise um, the appearance of a conflict of interest. And Republicans want to keep the focus on corruption, of course, Judy, and they're going to use Hunter Biden and Burisma to do that. Now, to Yamish, um, early in the day, uh, separately, the White House did finally release something they were going, they said they were going to, and that is a transcript of the memo uh, describing the first phone conversation between President Trump and President Zelensky. What did we learn from that? Just as this second public hearing with Ambassador Yovanovitch was getting underway, the White House released a memo, not a transcript, but a memo of a call between President Trump and President Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. It was their first call in April. And in that call, President Trump was essentially congratulating President Zelensky, saying, it's a really great that you were elected. I'm looking forward to having you at the White House. They do not talk about Joe Biden. They don't talk about Burisma, which is the board of, or the energy company that Hunter Biden was on the board of. But it's important to note that Joe Biden was not yet running for president. So the former vice president had not yet entered the race. The second thing to note is the White House put out a readout of the call. It's basically a short note of the call to reporters in April. And it said that in that call that President Trump and the president of Ukraine had discussed rooting out corruption, except that today the call memo does not say anything about corruption. When I pressed the White House on that discrepancy, they said, well, actually, the National Security Council is the one in, in charge of putting out those readouts. So really, you should go talk to them. That's significant because, because Army Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who said he had an issue and was concerned about the president bringing up the Bidens in the July call, is one of the people that would be involved in getting that readout ready. So what you have is essentially some people thinking that the White House is now blaming someone who had a concern about that July 25th call for not having the first call, the April call, be a accurate portrayal of what was discussed. So interesting. Lisa, we talked a moment ago about what the Republicans were trying to accomplish. What are the Democrats trying to accomplish, and do they think they are doing that? They want to make the point that the president was setting up a system where corruption itself could blossom. And they wanted to establish a connection, essentially, between the president and Rudy Giuliani and what was happening in Ukraine. A big part of that connection, a man named Gordon Sondland, the ambassador to the European Union we've talked about before, also a man who donated, and this is important to remember, a million dollars to the Trump inaugural. So listen to this line of questioning from Chairman Schiff to Ambassador Yovanovitch about this idea that her ouster was the first step in bringing in potential corruption, that these forces at work by Giuliani needed her out of the way to gain personally. Here's the question. But what if the president could put someone else in place that wasn't a career diplomat? What if he could put in place, say, a substantial donor to his inaugural? What if he could put in place someone with no diplomatic experience at all? What if he could put in place someone whose portfolio doesn't even include Ukraine, 
Might that person be willing to work with Rudy Giuliani in pursuit of these investigations? Yeah, maybe. That's exactly what happened, wasn't it? Yes. It's extraordinary to hear her say that. That's basically associating Gordon Sondland with kind of this idea that uh, there were personal interests at stake. And we're going to hear from Gordon Sondland next week. That's He's right. Coming. I believe on He's Wednesday. Coming to testify. Mm -hmm. um, Yamish, finally, back to you. Uh, the hearing ended this afternoon, but then the committee continued behind closed doors. Give us a quick sense of what's come out of that. I know a little information has come out, and then what we should look for uh, in the week ahead. David Holmes is an aide to William Taylor, who is the top U.S. diplomat in Ukraine, who overheard Gordon Sondland, the EU ambassador, speaking to President Trump. He told lawmakers just a few moments ago that the reason why he could overhear that call is because Gordon Sondland had the cell phone far away from his ear because President Trump was speaking so loudly. And what he heard was President Trump essentially saying he wanted to have investigations into the Bidens. That aide, David Holmes, also told William Taylor that President Trump cared more about the investigations of the Bidens and his 2020 campaign than anything else that was going on in Ukraine. So that's significant. And next week, we're going to see more depositions and possibly and also more public hearings. Hearings uh, that continue uh, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Yamish, I'll send her a long day for you. Lisa Desjardins here at the table with me, Nick Schifrin. Thank you all. Thank you all. I saw that stretch. <laughs> Get ready.